Hello everyone, welcome back. In today's video, we will discuss the transmission of knowledge or learning tradition in Islam. Now, we are going to explore the formation of madrasa. So what happened back then? When did it begin? Okay, What happened back then during the, the time of the companion of the prophet? And uh, to those of you who uh, grew up within the tradition, you must be familiar with the word madrasa. Yeah? This, is, this is how we... Uh, uh, define what we call today the Islamic parochial school, just like uh, the Catholic school uh, as part of public education here in, in uh, Saskatchewan. Okay, so madrasa in general is, 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 is a place, is a place where students learn uh, basic knowledge of Islam, uh, such as, of course, uh, the study of the Quran, yeah, memorizing uh, short verse, verses of the Quran, short hadith, this is this is the place where students learn to write not only uh, uh, Latin alphabet but also Baghdad, of course the uh, Arabic uh, character Arabic alphabet. So madrasa play a major role in uh, what we call the entire uh, Islamic uh, civilization. In this case, these are the this is the foundations of a uh, the transmission of knowledge. Now, in the past few years, though, uh, madrasa had has gained a very negative connotation in this case uh, for those of you who are familiar with a, uh, the American war on terror perhaps in this case you probably would recall how Madrasa uh, was seen described as the breeding ground for uh, a uh, radicalism, Islamic radicalism, Islamic terrorism in that case Okay. So during the American War on Terror, especially post 9-11 back then, I remember how Madrasa uh, was described to have been the place where uh, fundamentalists and terrorists spent time yeah, to learn this uh, hateful uh, doctrine okay, against uh, Christian, against European. And uh, the Secretary of Defense back then, during the uh, Bush administration, Donald uh, Rumsfeld, is known to have said that are we capturing, killing, or deterring and dissuading more terrorists every day than the madrasa and the radical ulama are recruiting, training, and deploying against us? So that is the type of image that we, that we, uh, that is that that are shown to us. Uh, uh, during the uh, uh, the American War on Terror, so Madrasa had had gained a very negative terminology as a place where uh, radical jihadists, radical uh, terrorists, uh, spend their time to learn this uh, what they think of a hateful uh, ideology. Statistically speaking, though, those who engage in terrorist activity yeah, radical jihadist movement in this case are not graduated from madrasa okay okay based on the statistic take a look at the uh, 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 biography of individual or background of individual who committed a uh, terrorist activities who join a terrorist group and including the leaders of the uh, uh, movement the second in common Back then, second common, now the first common of uh, Al Qaeda, Ayman al Zawahiri. Who do you think of Ayman al Zawahiri? He is a medical doctor. Okay, he used to be a, an eye surgeon, uh, work in uh, Saudi Arabia, and it was in Saudi Arabia that he met Osama bin Laden. Okay, most terrorists who committed a 9/11 uh, uh, graduated from uh, engineering uh, school. <laughs> okay, so engineering school, medical school contributed a significant number of terrorists than a madrasa. This is, uh, I mean, please do not take that literally. Okay, uh, well, based on uh, the data that we gather in this case, uh, tracing the individual uh, terrorists, where did they learn? Uh, skills including knowledge in this case they spend some time in secular universities and these are uh, individuals who are educated in a specific uh, training uh, and those training were not offered by madrasa okay so in this video we are focusing on the origins of madrasa and try to uh, yeah uh, describe try to help you to walk through to understand the uh, formation of the madrasa system did the prophet muhammad establish madrasa as simple as that okay ask that question what happened back then during the lifetime of the companion of the prophet muhammad 
where did they learn okay what types of knowledge did they learn back then okay so at the end of this video you will be able to first of all describe the importance of knowledge why do uh, individual muslims need to learn okay is there any a uh, religious impulse in this case is it required at all to to learn in islam okay i'll show you uh, the answer and then in the process you will be able to explain the uh, format of learning what types of learning activities they had back then okay was it a uh, direct learning encounter uh, between teacher and and students okay what types of meeting that they had back then okay and then uh, of course uh, since uh, learning activities was not just the focus of specific groups uh, the sufi that we mentioned earlier in the previous meeting also spent time and committed to uh, the transmission of knowledge uh, and in many cases uh, the distinction between sufi learning transmission and non-sufi learning tra transmission were blur why because we are uh, modern entities modern individuals we are used to uh, the division of labor yeah this is Sufi. this is a scholar of islamic law this is a theologian okay so we we specify we distinguish uh, we distinguish a uh, uh, specific activities based on specialty back then there was no such thing as specialty okay it wasn't as clear as we uh, as we uh, we are used to in uh, in the modern context okay and this is precisely the importance of uh, uh, tracing the uh, learning tradition in islam and similarly you would find similar tradition i mean similar development of uh, uh, learning practices learning tradition in other religious tradition as well okay in buddhism is evident in in the trans the, the tradition of monastic uh, community the sangha okay ashram in hinduism and then of course in uh, catholicism also uh, from uh, yeah part of the uh, church institution was to provide learning space okay i will explain in the process if possible so what does islam says uh, uh, about the importance of learning there are many traditions within the islamic tradition within the islamic religion uh, highlighting the importance of learning guess what the first revelation uh, quranic revelation sent to the prophet muhammad insist on the importance of learning Ikra. read okay read the signs of god reads the uh, the creation okay don't, again uh, i don't want to go into that detail i don't want to recite a quranic verses i have uh, recited uh, uh, many verses already i don't want to make it uh, as if uh, this season this class season is similar to that of uh, a sermon okay and just to give you an idea how important is the learning tradition uh, the importance of acquiring uh, knowledge in islam take a look at the first uh, First, the first a uh, Quranic verse revealed to the Prophet Muhammad highlights the importance of learning. Iqra, read, O Muhammad. Okay, Iqra bismi rabbika. Now that I'm reading the Quran, Iqra bismi rabbika lazi khalaq. Okay, so and then not only that, the numerous hadith again uh, for those of us who spend some time in a um, madrasa system uh, myself included in this case those are uh, daily doses for us to memorize hadith including this hadith like this seek knowledge even as far as china okay okay shin was china back then now china back then was seen as a uh, the center of uh, a uh, transmission of knowledge okay yeah it was normal because it was uh, it is still considered uh, the uh, the oldest civilization okay where uh, the tradition philosophical tradition uh, literary literary uh, literary tradition what we call today confucianism uh, started back then Taoism, and not to mention how a uh, the tradition of uh, Indian tradition, uh, Buddhism from India, brought to China and eventually become a different a uh, uh, articulations of Buddhism 
in China. Okay, I'm not saying that Musl the Prophet Muhammad asked Muslim to learn Buddhism and uh, Confucianism in China. No, but the, the tradition, the tradition of knowledge uh, circulated in China was seen as an example. Okay, and not only about religion, there are uh, practical knowledge as well. Uh, if, if you take a look at the detail of uh, Daoist uh, collection of knowledge, okay, and how they govern themselves in terms of uh, political administration, in terms of a uh, uh, medical a uh, formulation that they had back then, were seen as a uh, as an example. Uh, for Muslim as an ideal example for Muslim to again to acquire in terms of their ability back then and that is precisely the context of this hadith whether this hadith is authentic or not that's a different question okay there are people individual uh, within the Islamic community who argue that hadith is weak <laughs> but what happened as we learn in the, in the previous context a weak hadith is still a hadith okay so a weak hadith is still a hadith meaning what it is still better than not having a hadith at all. This is a tension between those who rely on reason and those who rely on scripture. And hadith, in that case, the collection of hadith uh, are seen as uh, equal to scripture, even though, of course, not the same hierarchy. Okay? And then the second one, the quest of knowledge to be incumbent uh, upon every Muslim man and Muslim woman. Okay? Talabul ilmi faridatan ala kulli muslimin wa muslimatin. Okay, I still remember about that. And, and again, of course, there are many hadiths that, uh, that says like this. Uh, knowledge is the highest nobility, just as love as the highest of ties. If one is ignorant of knowledge, it is as though the person is ignorant of his or her parents. This is just to give you uh, some selections of uh, hadiths that shows the importance of uh, acquiring knowledge. So acquiring knowledge is part of a uh, pious activity. Okay, it's part of the uh, 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 yeah uh, part. I will explain to you eventually. Part, part of individual obligation. Okay, those who seek knowledge back then and died in the process is considered a is considered a martyr. And then it is precisely on this basis that international student that we call today international student those who travel for the sake of acquiring knowledge acquiring hadith were entitled to receive zakat okay. perhaps it is uh, an, an imaginable for us who live in the modern world to give a uh, pre-tuition to a student coming from let's say indonesia <laughs> it's it, as an, an, an uh, imaginable in our context today but that's what happened back then okay international student entitled to receive zakat and these are on the basis of this because they were uh, seeking knowledge they were uh, on uh, on pious a journey back there to gather knowledge to to uh, walk on the on the footstep of the uh, uh, prophets okay the ulama scholars are considered the the uh, inheritors of the uh, prophets in terms of the language yeah the, they are the one who maintain the transmission of knowledge so what happened back then what was the institution how 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 did they learn okay what type of gathering that they had back then now keep in mind that what we what we call madrasa to, today is a uh, equivalent to a building madrasa as a building okay uh, when we call, when we use the word, when we define a madrasa, in this case, our reference would be a building, madrasa, Nizamiya madrasa, Al Azhar madrasa. Okay, keep in mind that those institutions, as a building, as a separate institution, okay, the creation of those building came much after. Transmission of knowledge took place during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad and his companion. Omar started that. The second Caliph started that. Uh, uh, instructing uh, fellow Muslim to uh, learn the Quran. <laughs> Keep in mind, uh, Muslim back then converted to Islam. They learned Islam back then. These are not born. Uh, these are not uh, individual born Muslim. Okay, they become Muslim when they reach adulthood already, and many of them totally have no knowledge whatsoever 
about the Quran, about the examples of the Prophet. Keep in mind again the next generation of Muslim in this case were the Prophet, during which the Prophet already died. Where did he get the knowledge about the uh, uh, about the hadith or the uh, the, the um, guidance from the Prophet. It was from the uh, those who lived during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad. And at that time there was no madrasa. Okay? There was no institution like madrasa that we call today a madrasa, okay? As a school with a building, specific building, specific uh, classroom. So learning place back then took uh, place okay uh, learning activity took place in a mosque as part of uh, yeah part, part of uh, worship activities okay now paper medium of writing was expensive okay in many cases uh, the transmission of knowledge took place orally uh, to those of them who uh, managed or had the ability to write purchase paper paper was expensive keep in mind uh, they would use they would write uh, the uh, learning uh, the knowledge that they uh, they receive from teachers from their teachers in this case and in the process of this uh, transmission of knowledge they would read their a uh, whatever they had written to uh, their teacher uh, yeah, gradually, so the format was that the normal, uh, the uh, the standard format was oral transmission, but not to exclude the ability of individual to write down their knowledge. Again, uh, keep in mind that uh, take a look at the hadith. Right? Hadiths uh, were written by companion of the prophet, unlike uh, the. Uh, yeah, hadith was not written. Hadith, uh, the Quran was written. I'm sorry, I'm I'm, I'm mixing the two uh, in the process in this case. Hadith was not written. It took some time for Muslim to to compile hadith precisely because it was not written. The Quran was written, so the idea was not to mix between the two in this case uh, uh, to confuse between the two document, right? Uh, only Cor only the Quran was written, and it was canonized uh, after forty years. Uh, of the first revelation okay so again in the process just uh, think of hadith again when hadith was transmitted when a hadith was transmitted by a scholar by a hadith memorizer okay it wasn't necessarily written by uh, the companion who attended the hadith session okay it was memorized so we can learn from that we can take that as a data for us that learning transmission back then assuming that we are talking about hadith learning transmission back then was done orally but not to exclude uh, individual activities individual uh, a Muslim back then who had the ability to write and had the ability to purchase paper, but paper too was a uh, recic uh, It could be recycled by washing by then uh, to conserve again to 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 be reusable by uh, By the same person for the next uh, teaching material Okay Now the format of gathering back then was a halakha, a study circle, rather than a uh, uh, yeah modern style of classroom back then. And what happened back then in this halakha, a teacher would sit in in a corner, dictating lesson while students taking taking down his his words or memorize his uh, his word. Now, since it was taking place in a mosque, in a halakha, and assuming that this halakha was not the only one halakha available to them, uh, students are free to sit in one halakha, or if he doesn't like it, she doesn't like it, she moved to the next halakha. Okay? It was informal, it was a uh, yeah, open to anyone who had the access to uh, the mosque. Okay, I spent some time in Again, not some time, but uh, yeah, a time in Medina, spending halakha from one halakha to another halakha, just to feel how the transmission of knowledge uh, uh, 
taking place in in halakha context okay not necessarily in our in our uh, modern secular a uh, institution where everything is formalized okay uh, from registration from enrollment and from admission from tuition okay yeah, these are modern format back then it wasn't that formal uh, formalized okay uh, there was no such thing as registration a uh, yeah uh, curriculum that we call today curriculum outlines that kind of thing when it comes to the actual syllabus or the actual curriculum, they do have curriculum, even though it was very basic in general. In this case, most of uh, uh, knowledge transmission of knowledge activities conducted being done in mass uh, focuses on uh, the Quran, yeah, the, the study of the Quran, the study of Tafsir. Again, uh, I, I, I spent some time in, in this class to explain uh, the Quran. Yeah, Tafsir is what. That tafsir is exegesis. It's not as simple as translation in this case. Yeah, uh, exploration uh, of the Quran, the meanings of the Quran, and then of course hadith, during which uh, individual back then were expected to memorize hadith, and then this individual who ab who were able to memorize hadith would receive a uh, his name as part of the uh, part of the uh, isnad. Is not is the chains of transmit uh, transmission the chains of transmitters okay if uh, I am a hadith teacher and you are uh, a student in this case so you could say that this hadith is from me Fahrizal Halim and and this is you reporting that this hadith on the basis of the knowledge that uh, we transmit to you and then my teacher transmit to me and then my teacher my teachers 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 from the prophet muhammad that kind of thing so the names uh, are preserved okay in in the context of the hadith transmission and of course uh, after those hadith and uh, quranic verses uh, students are expected to learn the uh, what we call today uh, uh, islamic law okay uh, that include knowledge about rituals, personal hygiene, income and uh, property tax, food and drink. These are basically uh, the type of uh, fiqh collection. If you take a look at uh, uh, a fiqh manual, jurisprudence manual in the Islamic tradition, from chapter 1 all the way until chapter 12 or chapter 13, in this case, those are provided, provided, provided in detail started from tahara basic personal hygiene and then prayer move on to the next one fasting move on to the next one zakat move on to the next one a uh, 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 related to crime and punishment <laughs> again punishment isn't, isn't necessarily part of the subject but part of the uh, 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 dealing with the rights of others yeah if we in, infringe the right of others then there are consequences this is what they call punishment but that not but that's not necessarily punishment by physical punishment capital punishment I don't want to create uh, 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 the image that Islamic law is all about punishment no that's not true it is part but that's not the focus okay that's not the whole focus that's not the whole uh, subject of Islamic law Islamic law deals with uh, sales a proper contract okay sex education marriage maintaining uh, uh, harmonious uh, relationship with others okay those are more, much more important than uh, punishment that we uh, often see uh, from uh, media portrayal of Islamic law now those are what we call here uh, the minimum knowledge of an individual Muslim and that is precisely the reason why each individual Muslims are obliged, are expected to learn of uh, some of this uh, knowledge. Okay, in the Islamic tradition, this is what we call the, the category of obligation. There is the category of individual obligation, far al ain. Okay, each individual are expected. Each individuals are expected to uh, be able to read Fatiha, the opening chapter of the Quran, to be able to uh, to know basic personal uh, hygiene, to be able to know basic 
a uh, uh, doctrine of the Islamic faith, the concept of Tawheed in this case, right? And then the next one, which is also which are also very important and yet not necessarily fundamental as the, uh, the previous category, this is what we call a uh, communal obligatory. Still obligatory, but not necessarily for individual upon individual. Okay. Those include knowledge of sewing, those, those include knowledge of uh, agriculture, <laughs> yeah. uh, all secular knowledge, all types of uh, secondary knowledge, which are very important for the maintenance existence of the community, in this case, but in a sense, not necessarily substantial for the existence of individual, for the, yeah, for the well-being of that person. Okay. Now, secular knowledge. Uh, I'm using modern terminology, secular knowledge of foreign science, such as astronomy, calculus, physics, philosophy. Those were normally excluded from uh, the uh, mass curriculum back then. I'm not saying that they are not important. Of course, they are important. Okay, and gradually those are uh, excluded. Why? Because many, uh, yeah, they lost uh, the battle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, uh, this is just to make you uh, to make the long story short. Uh, Usually, what happened to uh, what happened back then is that this knowledge were offered in not in uh, madrasa mosque curriculum, but in an institution such as uh, Baitul Hikmah, okay? Baitul Hikmah, uh, uh, which was separated from uh, from uh, mosque activities back then. It wasn't considered a worship part of the worship activities. Now, the expectation of learning was not necessarily uh, instrumental of, for professional development to become a teacher, to become a scholar. That is a different story. But, uh, of course, there are, sorry, there are individuals who, who ended up becoming a teacher or uh, have eventually become a professional a individual in the transmission of knowledge. Again, this is something unique. Back then, people lived normal life. So being a scholar, being an imam, being an ulama was not a profession. Okay? Much of hadith transmitter were individual, individual uh, regular person in this case, who was an artisan, merchant, okay? uh, military personnel. Okay? They're not scholars, but they have the ability, they have the knowledge that they learn from their teachers, then their teachers from the previous teacher and from the prophet and then it was the they consider it was their duty to transmit knowledge to others okay if it was a duty am i allowed to take salary <laughs> uh, this it, this was a huge debate among muslim back then to what extent muslim are allowed to take a salary when they when they teach the quran Okay, of course, in our context nowadays, we need we need a living, right? We need uh, to maintain our life in this case, since we are a full-time uh, scholar. Of course, we are allowed to take salary. But back then, they were not full-time scholar. Uh, but not necessarily less knowledgeable than full-time scholar. And that is precisely uh, the issue where the, uh, uh, the question of moral question taking salary came to power. Okay. Now, in terms of the police, since it was it started in a mosque, gradually though it became specialized and uh, a specific place this were designated as a learning space. Okay, this is similar to uh, to the development of uh, of the church in Christianity. Christianity, uh, the church in Christianity started as as simple as a dining table okay gradually as christianity uh, become the region of the empire back then no less than constantine converted to christianity uh, the ability of christian uh, community back then grew they managed to develop a specific specialized uh, place where uh, within within that place were room specific room were designated for baptistry yeah, for learning and for praying okay and the office of deacon yeah the office of imam in that case so those are later development of, of uh, institution in 
Christianity and Islam. And similarly, uh, uh, we can see some similar development in this case. It started as a halakha within the same space as, uh, as prayer space. As community grew, children grew in this case, uh, Muslim decided to create a separate uh, room designated for learning activities, for games activities, yeah, and not necessarily confined in the prior space. That place in the Islamic tradition was called Maktab, okay, Maktab or Kutab. Okay, it is still part of a uh, mosque complex. It's still, it was still attached to a uh, mosque, but not necessarily the same place where people used to pray, as as it was before the creation of Maktab. Okay, and this is the place where children usually go and learn uh, how to memorize a short Quran. Yeah, short Quran. Yeah, uh, the, the the last part of the Quran. Uh, that are instrumental for individual Muslims to perform their five daily prayers. Okay? Now, who had the responsibility to uh, maintain and provide the funding? Was it the responsibility of the Caliph? Was it the responsibility of the ruler, uh, the Umayyad Abbasid Caliph, to maintain madrasa as uh, in our modern context? It is the responsibility of, uh, responsibility of the state to maintain madrasa? No, it was not. It was the responsibility of the community, local community, who are responsible to fund and maintain madrasa. Caliph might donate, okay? Caliph rulers, uh, elites of the community might donate but they had uh, but they were not expected okay it was out of their pious activity when they donated uh, their fund to sustain support madrasa but again it was also it's a fishy right <laughs> it, it was a fishy when it comes to the actual uh, political activities in this case think of the way think of the Abbasid dynasty where uh, during the time when uh, political legitimacy was very, very contested uh, uh, between one party and another. One way to show you that, uh, to show us that they are a good Muslim ruler back then was to donate to Madrasa, to support Madrasa, to build mosques. I'm not questioning their integrity as a Muslim, okay? Gods know, okay? They are good Muslim, by the way. Uh, we are not questioning them. But, uh, Activities such as donating and uh, supporting public institutions also entitled the person uh, who donated a special uh, status. And this is precisely what I was trying to uh, highlight in this case. Yeah, uh, I'm not questioning the integrity of uh, this uh, pious individual. By the way, there's no way for us to compare ourselves with the, uh, their commitment, their integrity. But at the same time, we also have to be critical. Uh, in many cases, bias endowment would also benefit uh, individual right here, right now, not necessarily in the hereafter. And uh, if they abuse that uh, recognition, they could use that. They could use uh, for whatever means. It could use for uh, staying in power. It could use to advance political agenda. It could be used as a strategy to advance personal interests as well. Okay, just be critical on that aspect. Okay. Now, what happened to those who uh, who were unable to contribute? A society who were unable to help the funding or maintenance of madrasa. They would volunteer. As simple as that. They would volunteer by helping, by participating, by sharing their uh, their contribution in many forms, such as uh, their uh, yeah their volunteer time. Yeah, and it was open for uh, any uh, member of the community to to join Madrasa, even though they might not have the ability to again to share the contribution. Why? Why? Because it was it was the duty of uh, community to provide education. Okay? It was considered a communal obligatory to provide education, including establishing establishment of uh, maktab, establishment of uh, prior space for the community. 
Okay. Caleb usually do not. Caleb usually do not uh, send their kid to uh, madrasa. They would hire a private uh, tutor. And many, in many cases, uh, those intellectuals, those doyen, those uh, towering figure uh, that we know uh, uh, from history are uh, the tutors of the uh, Caleb's family. That's how they managed to advance their research. That's how they managed to write book. Why? Because they were self-sufficient since uh, their profession as the tutor of a uh, caliph's son or caliph's daughter gave them all the privilege that regular teacher in a local mosque were unable, were never able to have the, the same luxury. The like, you name it, the like of Al-Farabi, the like of a, uh, yeah, even Ghazali, Shirazi, these are individuals who, who, or, uh, who were hired by uh, by the ruling authorities back then, the ruling politics back then, yeah. And of course, there are the other side of the story. There are scholars who refuse to work for the caliph. Now, after completing maktab, usually student who excelled uh, memorizing the entire Quran or acquiring a good writing and reading skill would continue. Uh, their study in uh, an advanced institution. What we call an advanced institution is madrasa back then, not maktab. Maktab is much more simple. Maktab is for uh, for children uh, from the age of 5 to 15 maximum. The next generation college is uh, what we call madrasa in this case, right? This is, this is a, a college level, not uh, elementary school. Now, mad madrasa gradually acquire uh, 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 a, a specific uh, designation, place designation, such as a lecture hall, uh, li library, although it was still uh, part, considered part of a mosque uh, complex. Okay? And again, gradually, it also included a uh, bathhouse, yeah, a uh, living quarter for uh, the staff, and kitchen, and dormitory for students. And it acquired all those complex elements uh, uh, necessary for students uh, to stay there full time. Okay, again, this is precisely in this context that uh, student teachers, student mostly in this case, international student, I said, why? Because they travel from different part of the world, different part of the uh, uh, caliphal uh, geographical control as international student, as those who came from a different uh, place far away from Baghdad back then, okay? from Damascus, traveling from as far as from uh, present day Uzbekistan or uh, Kazakhstan or from Cairo to Baghdad. So gradually many rulers eventually develop a madrasa, Indo madrasa, yeah, with the donation, Wakaf in this case, and that is precisely the reason why so many madrasa are named after uh, these elites. Okay, Mustansiriya madrasa. What do you think was Mustansiriya madrasa? It was from the Caliph Mustansir. Okay. Uh, Nizamiya Madrasa. What do you think Nizamiya Madrasa? It was uh, established, built by Nizamul Mulk, okay, the uh, the wazir, the prime minister of uh, the Abbasid Caliph back then, who was assassinated by Ismaili uh, assassin, okay, assassinated by Ismaili assassin. The word assassin came from uh, the Hassasiyun, okay, just to remind you. Now, again, this is precisely the context where I highlighted earlier uh, the ability of individual to donate uh, their wealth for madrasa also gave them, also uh, afforded them uh, social status. Yeah? In many cases, social status. Uh, if it was abuse, it could lead to, uh, it could allow the person to advance uh, personal agenda as well. Okay, so long before the establishment of Western universities that we call the Harvard McGill, uh, John Harvard, James McGill, uh, what else? Yeah, those those uh, institution in Baghdad there are similar institution named after the founder. Okay, named after the founders of this uh, institution. 
Now, learning format in madrasa and maktab, uh, not much different. Yeah, people study in halakha, and the corner of the uh, the cornerstone of the activity was precisely to memorize yeah, and the Quran and Hadith, and uh, specifically for those who manage to go to the highest level. Uh, like in our context, it's a doctoral level. In this case, they were expected to write uh, uh, dissertation. This is like a disputation. Yeah? They also learn disputation and uh, argumentation in the process, uh, defending their opinion and uh, reputing uh, opinions of those uh, whom they disagree with. Okay, and the outcome of this uh, high level of education was the ability to teach. And this is what we call today ijazah litadris well ifta. Ijazah is a certificate, certificate that attests the ability of the person to teach and to issue fatwa, legal opinion, legal opinion as as an expert in, uh, of course, in Islamic law. Okay, but this isn't necessarily a guarantee for uh, employment. Yeah, employment just like uh, in today's context is not necessarily available for. For individual better regardless of their uh, quality of education or level of education they still have to find it uh, employment if they could not compromise with uh, the job market they too could not get uh, the ideal uh, uh, position that they expect the Sufi community had their own uh, institution uh, which is called Zawiya. This is grad is initially a, uh, a retreat, a uh, hospice, uh, but it actually uh, it acqu gradually acquires status as a learning space as well, similar to Madrasa Mosque. And similarly, it was also endowed, supported by uh, members of the community, including Caliph, and a student who were unable to contribute uh, expected to engage in the recitation of Sufi Zikr, okay, or reciting the Quran, reciting the Hadith for the community, and uh, the donor, yeah. And in many cases, again, uh, keep in mind, uh, I will give you an example. Uh, Imam al Nawawi, in this case, he was a Sufi, and at the same time, he was a scholar of Hadith, and at the same time, he was a scholar of Islamic law, and he spent time in. Uh, uh, Subi Madrasa in Damascus, Baghdad. So there was no distinction between his position as as a scholar of Islamic law and as, as a Hadith scholar, as a uh, yeah uh, a grammarian, yeah a historian. In fact, in this case, on the basis of his publication. So again, many Sufi. This is precisely it. Many Sufi were in fact scholar of jurisprudence. Nawawi is the best example. Again, for those of you who are not familiar with Nawawi, Nawawi uh, is a Syrian scholar. Yeah? His burial site was destroyed by ISIS. <laughs> or not by ISIS, by a, uh, a group affiliated with Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra Prawn in Syria. His burial site was denoted. He was bombed by Al-Nusra Prawn in Syria. Uh, affiliated with Al-Qaeda, but also supported by the US government to destabilize Syria. <laughs> The enemy of my enemy is my, my friend. <laughs> okay, so that kind of uh, uh, logical thinking that we that we saw in the in the last few years. Now the learning pattern in madrasa and Sufi lodges continue to shape the lives of Muslim until their encounters with uh, European colonialism. This is the most uh, exciting part of this uh, class: is that the period of European colonialism. Please be, be prepared. Uh, colonialism, European encounter uh, with the Muslim uh, world in this case changed the shape of Islam. I'm not I'm not saying that Islam changed, but after the encounter with European colonialism, not the Crusade. The Crusade had nothing to do. The Crusade was just a minimum uh, uh, small event, okay? But colonialism, okay? Colonialism uh, taking place after uh, the period of the Gunpowder Empire shape dramatically shape the realities of Muslim up until today. Okay. And I I I highly uh, recommend recommend you to read the textbook when it comes to the actual uh, impact of uh, European colonialism on Islam. Okay. I would say that 30% of this class is about uh, the impact of European colonialism. Even our scholarship about madrasa, about hadith, uh, about Quran, 
in many cases are the product of uh, European uh, scholarship. I'm not saying that Muslim are not about to write, but in many cases, uh, we are responding to the uh, uh, scholarship established by uh, European scholar, especially in this class. Okay. So as a conclusion, learning is a very important uh, uh, activity for Muslim. Iqra Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Khalaq is a starting point. Read in the name of God who created. Okay, even before the establishment of modern school system, Muslim had maintained madrasa as and kutab as the learning institution long before the establishment of uh, of modern uh, school system. So if that is the case, then we could also argue that the literary level was very high because education was accessible to anyone and it was expected for a believer, okay? So if a believer Muslim uh, couldn't care less about uh, improving uh, his or her knowledge or parents couldn't care less to teach their children uh, of the Quran and Hadith, they're not good parents, okay? Because the expectation of Islam is that to teach their children uh, of Quran and uh, basic Quran and uh, simple uh, knowledge of uh, Islamic law. And that system still survives in many cases, although, again, in the modern context, in this case, in country, uh, uh, yeah, many part of the Muslim world, parents do not like to send their children to madras anymore. They prefer to send their kids to a modern school, yeah. And some uh, resistant parents uh, decided to spend a uh, uh, send their children to what school, uh, day time and evening time. Okay, and in in modern context, people try to combine the system, secular institution and religious institution in the same space. This is what we call today a Muslim parochial school, combining a state curriculum, secular curriculum and religious curriculum but there are people who still oppose this one instead of sending uh, their children to uh, this uh, hybrid uh, 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 curriculum system they, they send children to uh, traditional form of madrasa if they are here in canada they would send their children back home okay again there's nothing wrong with it this is just to give you an idea the variety of uh, thinking within uh, within contemporary muslim some would eager to send their children to secular university secular school uh, because they want their children to become a medical doctor or engineer but there are there are muslim families who would decide uh, to send their children to uh, a traditional madrasa. Okay? And that is for today. Thank you so much for your